Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our expert, non-expert and special guest James, Lord High Commander of the Science Cupboard, first of his name and knower of nothing. You're going to have to shorten that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> you look exhausted. <laughs> So, as always, we're wearing togas. It's a lovely sunny day and we're in a sweaty little room. And today we're going to look at the story of the foundation of Rome. So, previously on Stupid Ancient History, we took a quick look at the story of Aeneas. Or, in other words, Virgil's rip-off of Homer. <laughs> uh, and how this Trojan warrior set off from the doomed city of Troy in 1200 BC, headed to Italy and followed the instructions of his mother, Venus. And on the way, he managed to not only annoy Dido and the city of Carthage so much that they declared eternal war on him and all of the Trojans. Didn't he also talk to his dead dad at some point? Yes, he did. And he gets completely chased and hassled by Juno and Neptune, so it's not going particularly well. And then his, his mum gave him a, not a, a shield, not a sword, yeah. yeah. A magical, lovely magical shield. Yes, so with yeah. the future on it. <laughs> So yes, and after how that completely historically accurate, 100% reliable, not at all made up journey, he finally reaches Italy, marries a local girl and has a son called Ascanius, or loosely, Lulus. Until he's stabbed to death. <laughs> I mean, after an adventure like that, he's, he's, he's gotten, probably glad of the rest. He's peaked, yeah. He, it was pointless carrying on. <laughs> so anyway. After Aeneas is finally killed, his son grows up and decides he's going to establish his own city, the city of Alba Longa. Which he does. Yeah. Uh, and he and his descendants happily rule the city for the next few hundred years. Nothing too specific. Uh, no, no massive disasters or no. horrible wars? Or... No, seems to be fine. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's unusual. <laughs> yeah. So we go from this relatively nice quiet, calm. Well, we'll say that. No one no wrote one anything knows. bad down. And probably all kinds of bad stuff happened. Yeah. Just... Well, yeah. But we go from this period where we don't really know a lot about what is happening, and we skip forward to around 775 to 770 BC, and the king Procus has two sons. So we've got Numitor and Amulius. Now, being the eldest, Numitor is given the throne by Procus, but his brother Amulius He's having none of it. He's no. not happy. So somehow, Amulius manages to overthrow and expel his brother and make himself king. No one objects to this. Well, so it would seem, or they do object, they just can't do anything about it. Right, just okay. does it. Um, but if that's not enough, Livy gives us a little more, just in case we weren't sure, just to convince us that Amulius is a bit of a wrong So, so Livy? he says, he committed other crimes too. He killed his brother's male children. It's not very nice. So he kills his own nephews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And pretending it was an honour, he made his niece, Rhea Sylvia, a Vestal Virgin, which meant she wouldn't have any children as she had to stay a virgin. Right, okay. So is that is that like a nun or what is that? Yeah, right? basically, basically a Vestal Virgin. You hang around in a temple and okay. you're forbidden. Right, so okay. he's, he's trying to... He's cutting the bloodline. Yeah, he's cutting yeah. the bloodline. He's trying to prevent any kind of future competitors competition yeah. to the throne so no matter how thorough Amulius thinks he's been in cutting out any rivals and cutting off this bloodline Livy suggests though that the foundation of Rome was fated to be so the Vestal Virgin was raped and gave birth to twins she said that Mars was her father either because she thought it was true or because it sounded better if a god was responsible but neither gods nor men could save her or her sons from the king's cruelty. The Vestal was chained up and sent to prison, and Amulius ordered the boys to be thrown in the river rapids. Okay. So, yeah, according to the common Roman myth, Rhea Silvia is visited yeah. by Mars, the god of war, and, you know, nine months later, out pop two twins. Okay. As you do. I mean... It obviously gives a nice dimension to the Romans. They like being warlike, so if they're all fathered by the god of war... Yeah. And it's this link to the gods again, isn't it? So it's reinforcing Absolutely. that we've already talked awesome. about. Yeah. Do the, do the Romans... How do they feel about Mars? Cause, they love him. Right, because whenever I've read um, about Greek history, Stephen Fry's book, read it, yeah. um, Ares is kind of a joke. They don't. They cut, He's not really seen as 
They don't venerate him like they no, do the other gods. No, but, um, but the Romans really do go for Mars because right, they okay. are all about the army. Oh, okay. So being descended from Mars is just another excuse why they need to travel around the known world, conquering small pieces and take it over. Fair enough. But back to the story. So these twins are, of course, Romulus and Remus. And being a single-minded sort of chap who likes to stick to his plan once he's come up with it, uh, the twins are thrown in the River Tiber in a basket and left to drown. Okay, so... so Amelius is still not playing around. Still not playing around. There are all these very vague ways to kill people. Like, we're just going to leave... Basically, like the Bond villain, leave them in a room yeah. to die. I'm going to throw them in a the river. Not check that they've dead eyed at no. any point. Not throw them off something high. Yeah, so but... the, the, t the Tiber just runs through Rome, doesn't it? It's got yeah. very pretty... Several very pretty bridges. One I'm not so much at this time. I know, but there's one I'm very <laughs> fond of for the bridge in Rome. Yeah. What I was going to say, without I won't give too much away, but also the way that they are disposed of is used to show another positive characteristic of Roman kind of culture and also a Roman individual later on. It'll make more sense as we yeah, go through I mean, and you find out kind of what happens. The whole okay. chucking the kids in the river, um, when we talk about myth and reality, it's not a uniquely Roman story either, is it? Well, no, like Moses, Moses is I was going to say, in the yeah. river in a basket. Yeah. It's not dissimilar to Cyrus the Great, who's left on a mountainside. Mm. It's this idea that they are protected, they are survivors. I mean, to be fair, Bear Grylls has got nothing on these two because, <laughs> you know, he's had all this training. They're straight out of the womb, straight in the river. <laughs> but anyway... Yeah, at the time there's no city, there's this river, and then Livy goes on to tell us the next bit of the story. So in those days the place the place was our lonely wasteland. The rumour is that the shallow river left the basket with the children in on a dry bit of ground. A thirsty she wolf from the nearby mountains found the crying children and let them suck her milk. Okay. Perfectly believable. Seems legit. Hungry wolf wanders around, sees doesn't two kids. Doesn't eat the children. Doesn't think they have dinner. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I've never met a hungry she-wolf, <laughs> but uh, I imagine they'd be tea. Yeah. But no, because they're awesome. And but yeah. So this is where we get the famous image of the capsuline wolf, the she-wolf. It's all over Rome. Yeah. It's, yeah. So the twins are saved by a she-wolf, which is, as you've just said, immortalised in the famous Capitoline wolf statue, um, until they are discovered by the king's chief herdsman, who's someone called Festulus. And what does he do? Well, obviously, he takes the boys home to his wife to raise as his own. Of course. The she-wolf just goes, yeah, there you go, mate, see you later. Again, this is all sounding very Moses-esque. <laughs> um, so... So yeah, so at this point we're to believe, despite all the divine intervention and, you know, ordained destiny, a wolf suckled a couple babies. Yeah, I mean, have you never done that before, James? We don't need to go into what okay. my life's been. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just, but yeah, he gets it, what he can. This, this is... <laughs> <laughs> this is... <laughs> Okay, anyway. Moving on. Uh, yeah, this is all sounding like typical nonsense. Well, that's absolutely believable. What <laughs> do you mean? No, I mean, to be fair, Livy didn't even, even believe this straight away. Straight away, he chips in with this alternative version. Some people think that Laurentia was called She-Wolf by the shepherds because she was a prostitute, and the miraculous story may have come from this. So this is the way Romulus and Remus were born and brought up. Okay. So again, it's putting a nice spin on what's probably a pretty average story. Okay. She, I mean, she was a prostitute, but she was a prostitute, not a wolf prostitute. It wasn't yes. like a wolf hanging out on the corners, offering business. Did that she dress up as a wolf? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 does Livy say that? No. <laughs> so wh why why would they confuse wolf with prostitute? Well, the problem with wolves and the problem with wolves <laughs> and prostitutes. <laughs> The problem with wolves and prostitutes is the Latin for she-wolf is lupa, mm -hmm. um, and commonly brothels were called lupinarium, um, okay. like the house of the wolf. You've, you've been to one, Jim. I, I have been to one in Pompeii. Yeah, we should point out, in Pompeii, an archaeological brothel, not... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you for qualifying, qualifying that. that. <laughs> so it's likely that somewhere in the translation they've got wolf and prostitute mixed up and oh, okay. throughout the years, which which sounds better? Uh, raised uh, by a wolf or raised by a prostitute? 
Well, or a yeah. wolf prostitute. Or a prostitute wolf. <laughs> All are good. So this is why Livy chips in straight away with this clarification that, yeah, it's probably not true. Uh, so it's a pretty well-known myth. Yeah, especially in Italy. Yeah. Um, what happened next, though? Well, the twins grow up to be big, strong and tough. Quite okay. good Romans should do. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. they form a gang. <laughs> just, just a rabble. Yeah, just a gang. Yeah. You know, okay. As yeah. you do. But this gang is not interested in robbing old ladies or that kind of thing. So the gangs that I'm more used to. Not an East <laughs> Manchester <laughs> gang. <laughs> it sounds like you've been very strange robbing old ladies. No, I haven't. Um, so instead, they kind of fight off wild beasts, attack robbers distribute the goods amongst the people obviously so they're more like robin hood i say very yeah it's again very well, merry men sort of thing. yeah it's almost like we've heard these kind of things before mm. Mm. anyway as the gang gets bigger um various robbers in the region get angrier fed up of being attacked all the time so then they decide to attack romulus and remus's gang so okay. they all get together romulus fights off the attackers but remus is captured and he's brought before the king, Amulius. So the, dun, the, dun, the, dun. the robbers have a king? They're, they take him to the local king. Oh, okay. They don't know what to do with it. So they take him to the king. I'm expecting some kind of Scooby-Doo reveal here. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be too disappointed, James. No. So it turns out Faustulus, who's never told the boys about where they come from, um, but thought now would be a good idea to tell Romulus. Okay. So they've raised, he's raised him for all this time, not actually said, well, I should tell you something about where you're from. Yeah. But now that Remus is going to like, ah, uh, hmm, should it's, tell you something first. Yeah, and similarly, the, the king, Amelius, was thinking that he kind of recognised Remus from somewhere. So he looks at Remus and goes, hang on a minute, you look quite familiar. You which, look like you should be in a basket. Again, <laughs> is in it itself a bit, a bit ridiculous because I think if I saw a baby and then didn't see him again until they were like a 20. grown adult, they were in the 20s, <laughs> I, I know wouldn't you. go, hang on, I remember you, basically because most babies look exactly the same. So, <laughs> Yeah, and again, I don't think he spent very long studying them before going, chuck him in the river. Yeah, <laughs> So anyway, before Amelius could work out exactly who Remus was, he's still pondering, hmm. Romulus attacks his home with his men um, to free his brother, but they also kill the king. Okay. So he does free Remus, and he basically reinstates Numitor as the rightful king, who it seems recognised the two straight away, despite having never actually met them, which is yeah. quite handy. So either way, the bad king is dead, the good king's on the throne, and the heroes have been heroing and making everything okay. Okay. All perfectly legitimate and believable. Uh, so it's all going well for Romulus, Remus, etc. Yep. Um, no one's actually roamed yet, though, have they? That is a good point. No one has yet roamed. Um, so, we'll get into it. After sorting out the whole Numitor Amulius debacle, the twins decide that they're going to go for a fresh start. They want to build their own city. Just a cooler city for all the hip young... Absolutely. <laughs> guys in their gang. Yeah. <laughs> but, as they were twins, neither was the older brother. Okay. They clearly both came out at exactly the same time as well. Yeah. Um, so both believe that they should be the king of this new city. Uh, I, I will say I am a twin, and this is a constant source of tension with me and my sister. What, who should be the king of the new city? And, and how, you know, do you, how do you decide on massive family arguments um, about we, we the ha eldest? Well, she is technically older. She was born first, but we're caesarean. So we have what I like to call an elastic minute. If she wants to seem younger, <laughs> if she wants to seem younger, that's a that's an actual minute. It's inconsequential. She's fine just being a minute older. If she wants to seem really important, she stretches it out <laughs> and makes herself sound decades older than me, <laughs> just to make me seem small and insignificant. So, so basically, she's got you whips. She just gets what she wants. I, there's a long-established hierarchy in my family, and I'm at the bottom of it. Oh, James. <laughs> That's why I don't mind being in the science cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> so as they headed back to the Tiber, near to where the world had found them, each brother wanted to build their city on a different hill. So Romulus built a temple on the Palatine Hill and Remus on the Aventine Hill and they both waited for omens. <laughs> okay, so we just but you build your city, I'll build mine and we'll just see which one's better. Yeah, pretty exactly. much. Yeah. Okay. I mean 
yeah, and it's quite important that they point out these two hills as well because mm. it's when the Romans are reading Livy's work, they will presumably be in Rome and they'll be like, oh, I'm on, I'm on the Aventine Hill. That's quite cool. Oh, I've oh, been there. I've been there. It's great. I live just opposite. So, yeah, all these bits of geography, they're thrown in quite deliberately. Uh, so even without you going on, I can very much see where this is going. <laughs> what do you mean? But, yeah, you're absolutely right. So Livy goes on to tell us about um, the absolutely well thought out scientific method for choosing the location for a new settlement. So people say that Remus got an omen first, which was six vultures. After this omen had been announced, Romulus saw twice as many, twelve altogether. So the supporters of each man said their leader was king. Remus's supporters said he should be king because he saw the first omen, but Romulus's supporters said that he should be king because he saw more vultures. Okay. So obviously, there, there you go. If you want to set up a new city, what do you look for? Vultures. I mean, d I've, I, I've, I mean, I've only really been to Rome and Naples and bits of like Perugia and Umbria. I've never seen a vulture in uh, Italy. No, and also vultures you normally associate. Well, you don't. Associate They're not a good omen. No, I mean, the last thing you want hanging around <laughs> is something that's going to eat your corpse after you've died. <laughs> yeah. And they're obviously hanging around because you are likely to die, so they can scoff down on your corpse. But yeah, so. Six vultures, twelve vultures. So he carries on. The heated argument turned into a fight and Remus was killed by getting hit by one of the crowd. <laughs> Just a oh swift dear. boot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In the head. <laughs> so, so at this Remus point killed. they just each have their own gang and yeah. had a big gang. <laughs> the two <laughs> gangs have separated off. And yeah, they get into a big scrap and Remus is killed. Ah. But obviously, I mean, that is not the most commonly known version of events um, and Livy himself says no oh, there is more so the more common story is that making fun of his brother Remus jumped over the walls that Romulus had been building then Romulus was really angry and he killed him and shouted that's what will happen to anyone who jumps over my walls it just sounds like a weird old man who doesn't <laughs> let, <laughs> let, let him get your football back <laughs> So yeah, you can get killed by a crowd or killed for jumping over walls. I mean, well, neither of them are particularly heroic or epic, no, are they? No, they're not. I mean, is it, is, I don't know. Is it a big insult to jump over someone's garden wall? I don't know. I'll try it on the way home and see what happens. If well, you come in with my cast, then you'll know it's not gone well. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the second version is more well-known because that's the kind of more prophetic version of things that the idea is that anyone who challenges Rome's walls or tries to attack Rome is going to go the way of Remus mm. and it's also quite important as well this idea of fratricide that Romulus kills Remus that um, for the anything is justified for the glory of Rome Even right okay. killing your own brother Rome comes first so yeah there's a hierarchy and twins are at the bottom of it okay oh So with Remus's death, that's the end of Re Remus's dreams of building a new city, or Reem. Romulus is that what it was called? Probably. Roman no, Reem. Romulus's city is called Rome. Yeah. Remus's city, probably Reem, who knows. Um, so this is the foundation myth. This is what the Romans thought about how their city came into being. Um, and it is it's still really quite key to this idea of Roman identity, like I said. Wherever you go in Rome now, the image of the wolf is pretty much everywhere. Mm, it's on the it, fountains and stuff. It's on fountains, the fountains, it's on the AC Rome badge. You know, so this popular foundation myth, is, it's not just a specifically Roman thing, it's something that's held, held its value for a very, very long time. Yeah, and also when we're thinking, the next part, we're thinking about the different versions of the story. It kind of fits in what we've said, doesn't it, about the sources? In yeah. that things will have got changed. We haven't really got other sources that we can check what's been written in Livy. We don't know exactly where he was getting the information from. Oh, Augustus. <laughs> well, yeah. And if it's an oral history, then things will get changed or as they get passed blocks, down. Yeah. yeah, to different people. And um, yeah, like to, you say, Augustus. I mean, to his yeah. credit, it, it would have been really, really difficult for him to write a history of Rome using what he thinks is. The legitimate history of Rome that maybe it's not the she wolf maybe it's a, a 
prostitute, it would be really, really difficult for him at the time to say, actually, you know that thing everyone believed for about 700 years? Turns out it's not Wrong. true. It would not go down well. Even um, Augustus wasn't that like, audacious. No, no, because you, you use the myths that are already there. You can't suddenly start telling people everything they know is wrong and expect them to go, oh, oh okay. Yeah, fair enough. But I mean, again, the reality of the foundation of Rome is going to be a far less glamorous and exciting thing. There's not going to be she wolves. Well, effectively, you're looking at shepherds, farmers who build a settlement on top of a hill for probably defensive reasons mm. and grow and become quite popular because of the fertile land nearby. And they just outgrow everyone else around them. But it just doesn't sound as cool as raised by a she wolf. <laughs> well, the other thing as well, like you were saying about Augustus, that story, like when you're thinking about the story of Aeneas, it has lots of different characteristics that the Romans hold in really high regard. Yeah. So it's kind of how Augustus wants the Romans to be viewed and how he wants the Romans to think about themselves. So when we're talking about the fact that like the children are left and they're basically abandoned, as you get in lots of other stories, the fact that they survive is this idea that all Romans are tough and they're resourceful and you know they can look after themselves. But also it's fated as well that some mm. things are just destined to be. Yeah and it's also drawing this link between all of these different key kind of people and individuals who helped create Rome and using myth and legend as a way of linking them to Augustus so that he yeah. can bolster his power and he can show that he is the rightful person to actually yeah, be in charge. They'll look at Augustus and go, oh, Romulus did something like that. Oh, maybe mm. it's all right. I mean, we should point out as well that Augustus, before he becomes Augustus, he's Octavian. Augustus is his imperial name. He did actually want to take on the name Romulus. Oh, really? Until someone pointed out maybe that was a bit too much a on, little the on the nose. So, yeah, it's all about him building his reputation. There's a temple to Romulus in the Forum, isn't yes. there? Yes. Yeah. Get to that later. Okay. Don't worry, there's more. So there you have it, our very brief summation of the Foundation of Rome myth. We hope this has been useful. Leave us a comment below and until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.